Okay. Ready to go? <clears throat> so last time we uh, derived the BCFW relations and we started applying them. And uh, for the uh, exercise, one of the exercises yesterday, you were going to try to show that the amplitude with all pluses vanished. And then we used the recursion relation, given that the amplitude with all pluses vanished, to show that the case with one minus vanished. For convenience there, I took the negative one to be n minus, because we were always shifting that leg and wanted it to be negative. But due to our relabeling or the cyclic property of the trace, you could make any one minus that you want. And all the rest plus, and that vanishes. And then <coughs> for the uh, first non-vanishing case, the so-called MHV amplitudes, where J and any two legs were negative and the other ones were positive, we showed recursively this MHV formula, or the Park-Taylor formula, with this cyclically adjacent set of pairs in the denominator. These will lead to sort of universal collinear singularities when we, in a little bit, we'll, we'll come back to that. And then this numerator factor. And then also, we know by parity, parity exchanges the angle brackets and the square brackets, and it flips uh, plus and minus helicity into each other. So we can immediately write down what's called the anti-MHV amplitude, where almost all of the gluons have negative helicity, except exactly two have positive helicity. Again, we could take them to be J and N if we want, but we can move them around using by relabeling. <coughs> so that MHV bar formula looks just like this one, except there are square brackets everywhere. So that's enough to calculate four gluon amplitudes and five gluon amplitudes, because for four gluons, you could have all plus, that's zero. One minus and three plus is also zero. Two, plus, two minuses and two pluses, um, which really come in, if, if they're color ordered, they're are two distinct types. So these are the only non-zero ones. And then when you go to three minus and one plus, that's also zero by parity. And all four minuses are zero too. So basically, <coughs> the four gluon amplitudes are just described by these uh, uh, two types of helicity amplitudes, which come out of this formula. For five points, same story. You can have uh, two minuses and three pluses non-vanishing using this formula, three minus two pluses non-vanishing, but there's no other case. Every non-zero thing is either MHV or anti-MHV. When we get to six gluons, now we have the possibility of having three pluses and three minuses and that's called non-MHV or next to MHV in this case, because it has, even if you use parity, you have at least three minuses. And so those are uh, the next most complicated amplitudes that you have, and they sort of indicate what the general structure might look like. So let's just do the very simplest one of those, and uh, then we'll move on. So, I uh, wrote this down last time. There were some other ways of arranging the pluses and the minuses. There's sort of three distinct ways of doing it, and some of them can be related by the uh, KK relations, Kleist-Kleuf relations. And this one's the easiest one of this NMHV type. <coughs> so, as usual, we have uh, a number of Diagrams labeled by K running from 2 up to N minus 2. But this one in the middle, it uh, has three pluses on this side. And so it's impossible to make this amplitude non-vanishing. Even if you put a minus in there, it's a four-point amplitude with one minus 
and three pluses. So we come over here and we see that it vanishes. So we don't have that diagram. We have these two diagrams here and we're gonna ev have to evaluate this one. But this one is related by a flip symmetry. These two here are related. If you flip this upside down, you see the big blob goes up to the top, the small blob comes down to the bottom. And these minuses here can be made to line up here, flipped into pluses if you use a parity operation that conjugates the spinners at the same time. And you also have to do some relabeling to get the uh, labels to line up. So you have to, every time you see, a, say, an angle bracket one, you have to exchange it with a square six. and so on. Okay, so we won't have to calculate this one. We'll just apply the symmetry once we have this and then add a second term for this case. Okay, so now we need to write down one diagram. So from the BCFW formula, And uh, by now we're pretty used to writing down this anti-MHV type of tree. And we also know that we don't need to, uh, we have to put the hats on the Ks, but because the uh, square bracket one didn't get shifted, we don't have to put hats on the, on the one here. And then over here, <coughs> we have an anti-MHV five point tree amplitude which is why I went and wrote this down. So we use a bunch of square brackets and in the numerator, we find the two positive helicities, k hat and uh, three, and that's to the fourth power, but it always cancels against one in the denominator in this case. So I'll just cancel it off against the denominator. And the leftover stuff in the denominator is just the uh, cyclic, uh, combinations. Now, in this case, the square bracket six does get shifted, so I need to leave the hat on top of there. And now we need to <coughs> work out what the hats are. First of all, we need uh, Z, ZK for K equals two. So we had a formula for that, which was uh, that in general, it was minus k1 k squared over um, this uh, spinner product. Now this is just S12 or uh, uh, 1221. And this one, the one doesn't matter because it annihilates the uh, one here when it tries to contract with this one, so we just get a contribution from two. And then these guys cancel. So Z2 is just minus uh, one, two over six, two. And uh, again, one, the shifted one hat is just equal to one. But the shifted six hat, which is using the, f this is another way of writing the formula for lambda six tilde. Um, it had a term with a minus Z two times uh, the square bracket one. And when we use these relations, we need to compute six times K hat 
a for a couple different values of a. Oh, I forgot to write one more thing down. Let me just write the general formula for k hat 1, 2. It was uh, k1 plus k2 minus 1, 2 over 6, 2 times a product of lambdas, but for future use, it's so this is just standing for lambda 6, lambda 1 tilde. So then uh, this 6k hat a for, for any a, this 6 here will kill this 6. So we don't need that term. So we just get contributions from k1 plus k2. And then we get this uh, whatever a is. We also have this funny guy here, 5, 6 hat. And uh, for him, we need to uh, plug in here, contract this with 5. And when you do that and sort of put it over a common denominator, you get 2, 6 plus 1, 5 over 6, 2. So when I contract with 5, I get a 1, 2, 5, 1, which I just sort of rotated around to make a 2 with a 1, with a 5. And then there's, there's a 2, 6, uh, 5, 6. So I kind of combined, contracted this with 5 and combined a few terms to get this, this form. So this is the vector k6 plus k1 sort of sandwiched in between these two spinners. And Finally, one more thing we're going to need is uh, we're going to need 6 k hat 6 turns out to be 6 uh, 1 plus 2 6 but there's an extra contribution from S12. And this is S61 plus S62 plus S12. And this is a three particle invariant, S612. Now, to make use of these identities, these k hats are kind of ugly on the end. So, what we usually do is we multiply through by something like a 6k hat and then put in factors like this so that we can make use of these kinds of identities with 6k hat k hat a so when we do that we get uh, and then use all these identities we're going to get various factors. For example, this, this is going to just become 6, 2, 2, 1. And this 6, 2 is a very weird guy <coughs> because he uh, doesn't involve uh, adjacent uh, uh, guys. He would give a collinear singularity when 6 came to 2, and that uh, doesn't involve adjacent guys, so we don't expect that to be there. But then we come over here and we see that this 5, 6 hat has a factor of 6, 2 in the denominator that's going to cancel this one. So then we're happy again. Anyway, when you combine, use these rules and combine all these factors, you end up uh, getting this compact expression that mostly involves just these angle and square brackets, but there are a few spinner strings that are a little bit longer. And there's this 
three particle invariant. And uh, these things are basically all, almost all there for a reason to describe the factorization in various channels. What we did when we did these BCFW recursion relations is that we were, were utilizing the, the factorization in order to construct the amplitude. But we're not really using the factorization in all channels. For example, consider when three becomes parallel to four. We never had a diagram that had three and four on one side and its uh, intermediate state in there. So that factorization was basically put in because of the properties of the lower point amplitudes and not directly when we built the six point amplitude. But there you can see there is a three, four collinear behavior. Okay, this was one of the terms. We still have to add the second term, k equals four. Um, so I'm gonna just erase some of this stuff now and just add the second term and call this the amplitude. So A6 is equal to this. We can put the I out front plus So six goes into one square bracket, and I'll put that on the back. One plus two goes into uh, five plus six, according to that rule. And then the three becomes a four. And then downstairs we get two, three, three, four. That came from flipping around three, four, Four, five. And then the square bracket five, six, six, one came from the angle bracket six, one, one, two. And S six, one, two becomes S five, six, one. So that's the final formula for the six-point amplitude. So you see you have these multi-particle factorization poles. For example, the 612 pole is um, six minus one plus two plus three plus four minus, five minus. So that can be satisfied with an intermediate helicity like this. So <clears throat> if you are, uh, want practice understanding these spinner products, you can try to factorize or, or take this amplitude in the, into the limit when S612 goes to zero and check that in that limit you recover a product of two four-point MHV amplitudes. You see here you have minus minus plus plus. You can kind of see what's going to happen in the limit that S612 goes to zero. This looks like, maybe looks like the contraction of six with uh, an intermediate momentum, six plus one plus two. So that's going to give the numerator factor uh, that you have in the MHV formula. So if this is uh, uh, P or K, this is going to become 6K cubed, this, this factor over here. And then it's going to have another K3 cubed, which is the formula when you think of it as an anti-MHV amplitude on this side. So anyway, the, these guys here are here for a reason. They're ensuring this multi-particle factorization. And then these angle and square brackets, they're uh, ensuring uh, collinear factorization. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, discuss that in a second in, or sh work it out in a little more detail in the MHV case um, in a second. Now there are two funny guys here. 
these um, this, this thing 2, 6 plus 1, 5 in the denominator is a, what we call a spurious, gives a spurious pole. It vanishes, but not in a region where we expect the amplitude to have a power law singularity. Here's, an, here's how we can make it find a vanishing region for it. If, we, if K6 plus K1 is some linear combination of uh, K2 and K5, then this becomes 2 C1 times K6 plus C2 times uh, K5. Oops, K2. And um, in that case, the K2 goes this way and annihilates, and the K5 goes this way and annihilates. So that'll make this zero. And, uh, and six and one were outgoing, and also three and four. If uh, six plus one lies along the beam direction, then it can be made out of a linear combination of K2 and K5. So these two guys, six plus one, if they're perpendicular component, so if K1 plus K6 perpendicular to the beam is equal to zero, then this will vanish. This is actually a configuration that experimentalists sometimes look at for called double parton scattering, where you have four jets back, but they cancel back to back in pairs. This is not double parton scattering. It just is a, sing, a singular configuration of a single parton scattering that would look like double parton scattering a little bit. However, there's not supposed to be any singularity in this amplitude there. This term blows up, and this term blows up. But if you uh, are very careful, you can show that these guys cancel. Actually, it's not very easy to show that they cancel. It's much easier to just uh, generate these points numerically, go close to this region, and just see that they cancel. And uh, that brings up a question that Massimiliano asked me yesterday, which is, OK, I did the 6-1 shift. But why did I have to do that shift? I could have picked any other negative helicity here and any other positive helicity here. If you go through and do that, you're going to get formulas that look different. In the MHV case, it's so simple that they always end up looking the same. But they're going to look different, and they're going to have spurious poles in different channels. And, and then the two forms, you plug in some numbers, and you'll see they're the same. But trying to show analytically that they're the same, it's not very easy. So. Uh, so there's kind of an interesting representation here. In the old days, before the BCFW recursion relations, people tried to simplify down these amplitudes as much as they could. And they never had these spurious poles, but they would have things like a 1 over S34. So they were too singular in the collinear limits. This is really the right answer. This is the square root of S34. This is less singular. So it, there's this trade-off between making the physical singularities look nice and introducing some spurious singularities. There doesn't seem to be any way to avoid uh, one or the other. But the spurious singularities are very mild. They, they don't really cause any numerical problems, partly because when you try to do some Monte Carlo integral, there's no reason to want to be in the spurious singularity region because the amplitude's completely smooth there. Collinear regions you should be more careful about because you're, the amplitude's very big there. You're always sampling in that region if you're doing a, a Monte Carlo integration. Anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of all I really wanted to say about BCFW and give a few examples. Any questions? Yep. How many Feynman diagrams? I th if I remember right, it was uh, 220, but that's uh, not color ordered. That's the total number, I think. So uh, it's quite a few uh, less for uh, color order, but I don't forget. I don't remember the exact. Uh, but in principle, you 
you should calculate all of them if you're not doing color ordering. Yeah, so basically we take 220 diagrams and we just have to do one. If you did one of those other cases, you would have to do two or th maybe three, but no more than three, guaranteed. Yep. Um, are you saying that if I did a different shift because I found different spurious poles, you could argue that these must be spurious? Yeah. Or, or also to say it another way, suppose you were doing this numerically and you happen to throw a point near this spurious pole, so you're getting huge cancellations and bad round-off error. Well, if you knew you were there, you could always have a backup recursion relation in a different direction that would be smooth there. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so now we're just going to go back and look at collinear factorization just by staring at the MHV formula in that limit. And, uh, and from that, we can read off certain uh, three point amplitudes, quasi amplitudes called uh, splitting amplitudes. Now you might say, but we already wrote down the three-point amplitudes. They were just the three-point versions of these. Yeah, those, those were in complex kinematics. Now we want to do real kinematics, but not quite go to the limit where everything's totally parallel, but almost parallel. We'll take things to be parallel up to the, a singular factor in the denominator. Okay, so we're going to pick uh, the two collinear legs, A and B, and we're going to let KA be, uh, well, let's first let KP be K1, KA plus KB, and KA is going to be uh, parallel to KB and then parallel to KP. And there's some fraction when you split that goes into, uh, so we're going to take these guys to be almost parallel. And this is, uh, say, AN. I'm not going to bother labeling all the other legs. And in that limit, we expect the amplitude to factorize into an n minus one point times some quasi three point amplitude which we call a splitting amplitude and uh, here's P and uh, we'll label this by uh, split um, minus HP 
the helicity of the intermediate state um, with uh, A, H, A, B, H, B. So we want to compute these things just using the five point as an example. So the five point amplitude we'll look at is uh, the case with uh, one minus and two minus. Okay, so uh, let's see, what example do we want to use first? We want to take, uh, say, four parallel to five. So we'll take these guys here. So in that limit that four is parallel to five, this amplitude has a, we rewrite it like this. Now I have to explain how I got that. And in this limit, the uh, spinner products are basically the square roots of the um, of the corresponding momentum vectors. And you find that, therefore, they pick up square root of z for lambda a and lambda b uh, is approximately square root of lambda p. And the same thing for the conjugate spinners. So the guys who are becoming collinear, we want to eliminate them from the uh, result except for this singular factor which we leave here. Okay, so, so we get a square root of z times 3p from this factor. So it goes over here and gives us the square root of z. And then for 5, that gives us the square root of 1 minus z factor here and uh, this factor here. And everything else just goes along for the ride. So what we recognize now is the four-point amplitude In this case, there was only one intermediate helicity configuration that could contribute. So P has to be plus. And so we, and then this is supposed to be the splitting amplitude with the, we flip the helicity from plus to minus, four plus, five plus. So we read off the, the splitting amplitude uh, with two external pluses and labeled by a minus here is one over the square root of z. Maybe I make this a now just to give myself the general uh, case. It has this angle bracket downstairs. And remember AB was the square root of the momentum invariant SAB times some phase factor. And this is the conjugate one. So these uh, spinner brackets, the reason why they're so useful, the spinner products, is because they exactly ca capture the right collinear behavior of amplitudes. And therefore, they're the right things to put in the denominators of amplitudes. And amplitudes come out looking simple because of that. If you kind of uh, used a generic uh, Feynman diagram technique, you would usually put in a full 1 over SAB for a propagator of a gluon that then gave, uh, so this would have this would contain 1 over SAB. But you see, that's too singular. They really only go like square roots of SABs. 
So, uh, actually, the reason why the singularity is lower has to do with angular momentum conservation. In this case, we had two pluses here. And viewed going this way, we had a plus helicity gluon. So you have plus one angular momentum in this intermediate gluon. But then you have two pluses in the final state. So you violated angular momentum conservation by one unit. So there's kind of an angular momentum barrier, which accounts for the reason why this 1 over SAB gets lessened by numerator algebra to give the 1 over square root of SAB that we actually see. If you had just had a scalar phi cubed vertex, phi cubed coupling, then you would have zero angular momentum. And so you wouldn't have any angular momentum violation. And this would truly give you a 1 over SAB divergence in the collinear limit. So here's a quick question. What is the collinear behavior of graviton scattering amplitudes? So it's the sort of the square of the numerator algebra because the graviton, if we were to write down a graviton, the Feynman propagator for it would still have a one over SAB, okay? But the numerator, um, would now be violating helicity delta H of two. And so if we get a square root of SAB from violating angular momentum conservation by one, we must get a square root of SAB squared. So there should be no singularity. Should just go like SAB to the zero. But there could be some phase singularity. So you, you get stuff like this, AB over AB. So there's no singularity in magnitude, but there, there is a phase as you spin the two gravitons around their axis. So, th so again, this is the uh, graviton collinear behavior. Okay, so we computed one splitting amplitude for one, one helicity case, but you can get all the other cases out of this formula too, plus parity. For example, suppose we want to do split uh, plus uh, A minus B plus. So then we want to take two and three to become collinear instead. So we have a minus and a plus. We still get an angle bracket downstairs So now we're taking two and three to be collinear. So this gives us the AB. And then we have square root of Z and square root of one minus Z from this. But now look, we have, we have this two upstairs. So that's gonna give us a square root of Z to the fourth power or Z squared. So this uh, splitting amplitude has a little more asymmetric behavior. It has two powers of Z. Similarly, if we wanted to split plus A plus B minus, um, I think, uh, yeah, we get uh, the same thing but with one minus Z e in the numerator. And finally, um, well, there's also a case which has to vanish. Because the three-point tree amplitude with all plus vanishes, so does this co collinear kind of version of it. So I wrote down four formulas for you. And then there's... Uh, there's a total of eight different combinations, but you can uh, 
use uh, parity to get the rest of them. For example, split uh, plus uh, A minus B minus is uh, 1 over square root of Z, 1 minus Z, AB, up to some sign I forget. So that leads us to an exercise, which is using these splitting amplitudes, check the three goes to four limit of A6, the one we computed earlier, the NMHV amplitude. Split? Why? Uh, that label here is the intermediate helicity, and we write it like an amplitude in the all outgoing labeling. So we label it by the helicity moving back up into the big amplitude. It, you have to switch signs whenever you cross from this amplitude. You see this has a plus, and this has a minus. So those guys always have to be opposite sign in the formula. Right. So uh, in the very early days of, any other questions, by the way? In the very early days of QCD, the uh, collinear behavior of cross sections was analyzed by Altarelli and Parisi and uh, or they found physical interpretation of the evolution of parton distributions in terms of splitting probabilities. And those splitting probabilities for cross sections are just the square of these formulas. So we just take these and square it to get cross sections basically. And so the square of these things should be uh, uh, what are called uh, the altarelli parisi splitting kernels. We mentioned them earlier. But to be a little more precise, the uh, the splitting probabilities are uh, obtained by summing over helicities. For example, P G, G of Z, and then there's some overall factors of color and, and spin that I'll just ignore. We c you can easily work them out. You want to sum over the intermediate guy and then the helicity of P and also of A and B for this uh, general split uh, of uh, minus H, P, A, H, A. B, H, B squared. You can do that not just for gluons, it's just we happen to have the gluon guys handy right here. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to sum over all eight of these. And in, in half of the cases, we have to conjugate and replace angle bracket by square bracket. But when we square it, we multiply by the conjugate. And so we just get a 1 over SAB in any case. Actually, let me put an SAB in front because these things are defined without any uh, of the collinear splitting any of the singular factors in them. So all we want to do is ignore the angle brackets and square up the dependence on Z. So from the case where the two... Uh, outgoing gluons have the same helicity, we get a, a 1 over z, 1 minus z. And then we have two cases where the gluon helicities are opposite, and there we have to put in extra numerator factors, which are squared, which look like this.
So this is the uh, formula. If we want to be a little more careful, there's also a factor of the quadratic Casimir in the adjoint representation. Remember, we left off a factor of FABC because we were doing things color stripped. If we want to put it back and we square it, we get uh, this group theory diagram, which uh, is uh, F, if that's A and that's B, F, A, C, D, F, B, C, D, which is uh, C, A, which is N, C for S, U, N. And there's a numerical factor which I don't remember. Now, if you look up the Altarelli Parisi splitting functions in your favorite textbook, this is often written in a slightly different form, and there are often some plus distributions associated with the singularity when z goes to 1, and there's a delta function at 1 minus z. And to get that right, uh, you can't quite get it from this because we assumed that z was between 0 and 1. We didn't regulate the uh, endpoint behavior. But you can use something called the momentum sum rule to get those terms too. So anyway, all, all the basic uh, structure that was understood in the early days, kind of at the cross-section level, you, you can re-understand it in terms of these helicity amplitudes if you want. But that was typically unpolarized, so you have to just sum over helicities. Any more questions about that? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to a little bit of color kinematics duality. Okay, more erasure. So remember, we wrote down these uh, AN trees. And we said that uh, more or less there should be, since of the cyclic property of the trace, we can fix this guy. But uh, the number that entered the trace-based color decomposition was n minus 1 factorial. That is the number of permutations holding one of these guys fixed. But then we found out that due to the kleiss koif relations, there were identities among these, and there were only n minus 2 factorial. And then there are also the BCJ or uh, Bern Carrasco um, Johansson relations, which were discovered much more recently, which take this down to n minus 3 factorial. So that's, we're going to talk about these now. And it's also, anyway, so uh, if we were, had n equals 4, then we might have thought that there were 6, but then using, that is, 4 minus 1 factorial is 6. But using the kleiss koif relations, there are really only uh, two factorial, two. But in fact, there should only be one, according to, uh, it's not very big, but OK. There should only be one, according to the BCJ relations. So let's look at the uh, four-point case. And let's, uh, first of all, say, I'm going to make an observation, which is, that, uh, 
Well, we only have one non-vanishing four-point case, which is given by the Park-Taylor formula. And if you multiply it by S times T, the claim is that it's totally symmetric. So let's rewrite this factor um, as um, ij to the fourth times um, x, one, two, three, four. So x, one, two, three, four is uh, s, one, two, s, two, three. Oh, maybe just for reference. In the four point case, s, one, two, and s, three, four are the same thing. And similarly for the uh, other channels, and we just call them ST and U sometimes. So this is just uh, which we can rewrite as one, two, two, three. Um, So we can cancel, this S23 has an angle 23 in it. This S12 has an angle 12 in it. So we can put them upstairs. And you can also um, multiply top and bottom by 12. And then using momentum conservation, this is minus, we can replace the 2, which is being wedged between 1 and 3. We can replace it by a 4. And then after some cancellation, you can rewrite it like this. So from this form you can see a bunch of symmetries that it has uh, that x1234 is equal to x2134 x1243 x2143 so that's uh, sort of Z2 cross Z2, four, four, but actually there's one more thing you need for total symmetry, which is to look at X1324. So let's look at X1324 and divide it by X1234. So you get uh, 1324, 1324, and then uh, I rewrite I put x1234 upside down, use some more momentum conservation or something. Um, anyway, use a few more identities so you can check this. This is equal to 1. So this thing is uh, totally uh, symmetric. So there's basically only one uh, four-point amplitude. And uh, that this was actually, for the four-point case, amazingly, it was kind of under, this sort of stuff was understood in the 1980s. It was connected to something called radiation zeros, which uh, Massimilian Anno knows about because he looked at some of this in like WZ production, right? And uh, anyway, trying to understand the radiation zeros, people discovered stuff like this for the four-point amplitude. But nobody went beyond the four-point amplitude until Bern, Carrasco, and Johansson picked it up later in around 2010. Okay, so let me just uh, rewrite this, which, so ST, A tree, one, two, three, four, is equal to um, if I if I cycle to I don't know I could do this different ways but if you permute things in cycles you can uh, show that.
these guys are related like this. So any given relation of this type, you can always cancel one factor, like you can cancel the S here. So there are going to be factors of single kinematic invariance that come in when you um, uh, use equations like this. Now these were equations for, uh, or, or these are the relations for the color ordered partial amplitudes. But the best way to understand the BCJ relations is to use uh, something just, just in terms of um, um, these adjoint color structures. So those are the kinds of things we are doing when we describe the F basis. So we've got to introduce a little bit of formalism here. We need to keep that. So they say, draw all the cubic graphs, like the cubic Feynman diagrams for a given, uh, <coughs> for a given um, amplitude, endpoint amplitude, and for each such, so call that the set of cubic graphs, gamma is cubic, and, and G is a graph, and then the internal lines of G, you just write down a propagator, the scalar propagator factors, okay? And then you write down the color factor in terms of FABCs, like we were using that notation before. So you have you just uh, take that and write down the combination of FABCs, if that were the, uh, the following the adjoint lines. Of course, you might say that uh, I also have quartic graphs, right? So these graphs don't look exactly like this, but we can use a trick. We can blow this graph out by putting a one over p squared downstairs, and then we get a p squared in the numerator. But also the cubic graphs have numerators too. So we, we uh, take the four point graphs and we somewhat arbitrarily move them, uh, put in factors of p squared over p squared the quartic graph has products of two FABCs. So you look and see which way the two FABCs are contracted in a given term in the vertex. And then you assign that to the corresponding cubic graph because there were really two FABCs there. And then you put a fake P squared in the numerator so that you can put an extra P squared in the denominator to account for this guy. So like in the four point case, there's a vertex here, which has a few different contractions. So one of the tra contractions might be FABE, FCDE. Uh, uh, yeah. So that contraction tells you that from the color point of view, it really, as a color diagram, it looks like this. So that tells you that you want to assign it to this cubic graph but it didn't have a p squared in it in the denominator because the Feynman diagram didn't have a one over p squared. So you just artificially put in a one over p squared so that you can lump it in 
with the uh, cubic graphs that look like that. And then the, there's a p squared in the numerator. And so that's part of what we mean by this ng. So this, this is just FABCs. And this is kinematics. So the p squareds from quartic graphs go in there. But then all the numerator algebra from the cubic Feynman rule also goes in there. So that's just a, a way of uh, writing down the generic tree amplitude in a kind of overcomplete basis because we haven't taken into, a, into account the color Jacobi identities yet, like we did when we were deriving the, uh, um, <coughs> the F basis representation of the amplitude. So now, Let's look at what that looks like in the four-point case. That is, we want to figure out what's the relation between these ends and the color-ordered amplitudes which obey these identities. In order to do that, we need to do a little group theory. In the four-point case, we just label the graphs by uh, S, so G belongs to S, T, and U. Okay, so the S channel graph would be one where the propagator is, has S1, 2 in it. So there are three graphs, S, T, and U. And the color factor, C, S, we write down this color guy. And now we replace these by, by these uh, trace... Uh, combinations like we did in the first lecture or second lecture whatever anyway when we plug that in we find that we get a plus trace one two three four minus trace one three four two plus two more that are given by reflections by flipping over the uh, trace CT is in the, this graph. And when you work out the traces, you also get a 1, 2, 3, 4, minus the trace 1, 4, 2, 3, plus reflections. And finally, CU is, oh, we're going to define it with a minus sign. And plugging in again, you get one minus trace one three four two plus trace one one four two three plus reflections. Okay, so now what we do is we plug these C's into this formula and collect on similar traces because the coefficients of the traces are what we call the color ordered amplitudes. For example, A4 tree of 1, 2, 3, 4, what's that equal to? Remember, it doesn't get a contribution from this non-planar diagram when you order things 1, 2, 3, 4, because, and you can see it doesn't, there's no 1, 2, 3, 4 over here but it's here and here with the plus sign. So we need to get a contribution from the numerator factor in the S channel divided by the one propagator, internal propagator in the S channel, which is S. And then we have to add to that NT over T. Okay, so these two traces here tell us to pick up the S channel term and the T channel term. What happens if uh, the uh, tree is uh, one, three, four, two. We come over here and we see one, three, four, two, but because it has a minus sign, we have to put in a minus ns over s. And then there's a, another one, three, four, two from the u channel, so we need a minus nu over u. 
And finally, the um, 1, 4, 2, 3 is um, minus nt over t from uh, over here and uh, plus uh, nu over u from the bottom line. Okay, so we have three numerators and we have three uh, amplitudes, but there's really only, they obey these identities. So now we're going to plug in these identities and see what they mean for how they relate ns, nt, and nu. So, for example, look at the uh, first identity here. That relates this one and this one. So what does it say? It says that uh, st times uh, ns over s plus nt over t is equal to um, us minus uh, nu over u minus ns over s. This s is, can be canceled. And if we uh, collect terms, we see we just have one nt, and it has unit coefficient. And then the coefficient of ns, there's a t over s here. There's a minus u over s here. And then over here, we have um, minus nu. So the uh, end result is um, that nu is uh, ns minus nt. Yeah, so in the four-point case, there are only three cubic diagrams, right? You can only, there are three different ways to connect any two guys, and those are st and u. But the numerator factors obey this relation, which we found by first deriving it for the color-ordered amplitudes. <coughs> but the remember, the color factors are not independent too. They obey a relation, the Jacobi relation. And in terms of this labeling, the Jacobi relation, you can check the signs if you want. Here I'm paying attention to signs, by the way, Victor. <laughs> so uh, the, the signs are exactly the same for the Jacobi relation. So there's this correspondence in this four-point case between the, uh, uh, the two cases. And uh, so the, uh, the BCJ uh, assumption was that this structure holds for arbitrary uh, endpoint amplitudes. So BCJ said, let's require, or we can check and see if it's true. Um, well, draw a picture first. Let's, let's just take this cubic graph and draw little circles everywhere we can between uh, that, that have four point uh, trees inside them. Let's call this graph alpha for example. And then there would be another graph, which is um, so this is called beta. And then there's a third graph, gamma, which. Uh,
So the point is you can divide up for any set of cubic graphs, you can uh, organize them into triplets. There will be multiple triplets and the triplets will share things. But anyway, whenever you see a triplet of graphs where the graphs are identical except in some four point thing where they're related by saying this one looks like an S channel graph, a T channel graph, and a U channel graph. So in that case, their, their uh, color factors are related by some Jacobi type identity. Something like this. So whenever the color factors obey that because they are triplets like this, then we want to re ask if we can impose um, n alpha minus n beta plus uh, n gamma equals zero. Now this is kind of a gauge dependent statement because you can, you can move uh, around these numerator factors because the color factors are over complete. So it's possible to move numerator factors from one place to another. That's a kind of a gauge transformation. But the claim is that there's some gauge for which these um, numerator factors obey this. And then once you know that, you can, yeah. Well, once, no, it, it is clear because you can use the Jacobi identity on the, on the middle circle and everything else is the same. So if these are in triplets like that, then, then, then this is true. But this part is the not obvious part. And, uh, but they checked that it was true in many cases. And the consequences of it are the, that you have an additional uh, freedom to relate. You can then use these relations to solve for uh, um, a generic amplitude in terms of in terms of amplitudes where three uh, legs, specified legs, are next to each other. Remember in the kleist coif relations, we were able to put one and n next to each other, or any two legs that we wanted next to each other. So, so BCJ argued that if that was true, then there should be a relation. So you start with the uh, problem is this is a very long formula, so I need more room. <coughs> And you don't need to write this all down because the exact form isn't very important. But, but they showed that um, you could take a tree amplitude and having already used the uh, kleist coif relations to put two of these guys next to each other. And then they introduced a generic configuration with these with some sets alpha and beta and leg three can be in any position. And then they were able to rewrite it in terms of a n tree where all three were next to each other and some permutation sigma. And whereas the kleist coif relations had only plus ones and minus ones, in their coefficients. In this case, you get, you're going to get uh, Mandelstam invariance. And in the four point case, you only get a linear set of Mandelstam invariance. But uh, in the endpoint case here, you get, or there's some denominator factor with the S invariant that involves leg two, four, five, all the way up to K, where K runs from four to n, and then there's some numerator factor in here, which is uh, quite messy, so I'm not gonna write it down, but uh, 
Well, it's, it's only messy because there are a lot of cases. It's not really all that complicated, but um, there's a product, so that's how you build up. It's actually linear in the momentum invariance. But I'm not going to bother writing it down. But anyway, they, they checked all these relations and uh, for, for many cases. And then later on, the, um, for these formulas were uh, argued in general in, uh, to hold using string theory in a pair of papers, one by Bjorn Bohr, Damgaard, and Van Hove, and another by Stefan Stieberger. And uh, the basic idea is that uh, uh, string theory is a theory of everything, right? So it should be a theory of these amplitudes. And uh, the way you calculate the amplitudes uh, for gluons in string theory, well, one way to do it is to, um, you the string is a one-dimensional object. As it propagates in time, it sweeps out a two-dimensional surface called the world sheet. And the world sheet has to respond to putting in energy in terms of these gluons, and they're things called vertex operators that um, are made out of two-dimensional fields that live on this world sheet. And so you can describe um, the scattering of gluons in string theory in this way. That's not exactly the same as the scattering of gluons in a field theory like QCD, but it contains it, it and then it has a lot of higher order corrections. But th these uh, relations are actually part of relations for full string amplitudes. And then to recover these relations, you take the low energy limit of the relations that you find in string theory. And the way you find them in string theory is by doing some kind of a contour deformation argument, where originally this guy was supposed to be just integrated along here, but you can integrate it all the way around and, and you get relations with different orderings in that way and I'm not going to go into the details. But you could derive these stringy relations. And interestingly, the stringy relations had an imaginary, a real part and an imaginary part. And the real part gave back the kleist coif relations, and the imaginary part gave back the BCJ relations. So that's uh, a nice uh, thing. The other nice thing is that the BCJ relations um, apparently hold to uh, at the loop level too. I mean, I, I w was working with BCJ and others on applications of these at the loop level, and they work in one particular theory through at least four loops, although five loops has been kind of a puzzle. But, yeah. Yeah, you could give a general proof of them. Right. That's right. At tree level, the BCJ relations were proven using uh, string theory. But it was a purely tree level proof. And so the question of whether they are obeyed at loop level is still an open question. In some theories, the structure is simple enough that like for the four point amplitude, you can find solutions to the BCJ relations. But the way you find the solutions is by making an ansatz for the structure of the numerator factors. And then you impose these conditions and see if there's a solution. So that works through four loops uh, in the nicest theory available, N equals four super Yang Mills theory, of course. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> when you go to five loops, you got like millions of equations. And uh, well, I, I dropped out at four loops, so I didn't try it at five loops. <laughs> anyway, th my collaborators, former collaborators, weren't able to yet to find a solution for it, for it. They've kind of gotten close, but, but uh, anyway, I should say that BC, the BCJ relations have been found at loop level in other theories too, at least at one loop. 
it's just uh, still harder to know what happens in multi-loops in general theories. So I want to just show you how they work at one loop uh, in the simplest case. And I'm not going to uh, explain why the one loop amplitude has the form that it does, but it has a very nice form. And then you could sort of see how the BCJ relations work there. Any other questions before I write down this one loop amplitude? Yeah. Yeah, so helicity doesn't play too much of a role in the BCJ relations. And uh, so there is another theme that I'm not going to talk about in these lectures, which is called the scattering equations. And it's also related to string theory, but in a kind of funny way. A long time ago, Gross and Mende, and even before that other people, looked at the very high energy behavior of string scattering amplitudes. And they found that the uh, world sheets were sort of pinned to particular configurations. So instead of integrating over all the possible world sheets, you just found specific ones dominating. And those gave rise to a set of uh, discrete solutions to certain equations. And there's a way of formulating field theory amplitudes so that uh, they can be written in a way that looks sort of like string theory. But all you do is you just solve these scattering equations. And then you have to plug in some function on these solutions, which looks very much like the string theory integrand. But you're not doing string theory. And it's weird because the gross mende solution was supposed to be for the high energy limit of string theory, but field theory is the low energy limit of string theory. And yet, you get to use these stringy-like equations called the scattering equations. So the scattering equations are a very much d-dimensional thing. Holicity is very specific to four dimensions, right? It, we have holicity because we're in four dimensions, because the direction's perpendicular, the little group, for um, in four dimensions for a massless particle is the number of ways you can move it and not change its direction or momentum. And that's just the perpendicular directions, SO2. And that's equivalent to U1, which is why we have a single eigenvalue, the helicity. If you're going to SO general dimension D minus two, there's no helicity. If you go to bigger dimensions, you gotta group the helicities into a bigger representation. So the fact that this is helicity independent says it's a general dimension thing. And the scattering equations are also a general dimension thing. And the, and the scattering equations mesh, mesh very nicely with BCJ. And also BCJ, as we'll say shortly, meshes with double copy or producing gravity. And the scattering equations also um, give you ways to build theories that are like double copies of each other more generally than just gravity from Yang-Mills theory. Any other questions? So there's one nice simple loop amplitude we can write down very simply, which is, so we do, uh, we're looking at going to Look at n equals four super Yang mills. <coughs> and the one loop amplitude for four particles in this theory is equal to this nice symmetric prefactor. A4 tree gets multiplied by S and T. And then I'm going to kind of write uh, this in a sneaky way.
So what you're supposed to see here is that there are three boxes, <coughs> but we're including all the non-planar uh, diagrams too. So this would be just the planar contribution it would look like this. And then there are these ones that are obtained by crossing uh, two legs. And I wrote sort of two identical graphs and one of them is for color and one of them is for kinematics. And I don't care which is which. But we could call this, uh, you know, we could say that the solid one is for color. So this is our standard way of writing color graphs. And then the, this one here is for kinematics. So we have legs one, two, three, four. And these are loop momenta L1 to L4, which aren't all independent. Then this is supposed to stand for the integral D4L of, uh, well, with some factor of one over just the scalar propagators. Okay, so the uh, way the BCJ relations work here is that we look at three graphs and So this one has a, uh, if we stare at this, the kinematic factor, when you slice it here and ignore the stuff, just look on the right, has a, has a factor which tells us that NU is equal to one. Because it's basically scalar numerators. Well, actually there's an overall factor of STA tree, but because this is totally permutation symmetric, it ju just goes along for the ride in this argument. We factor it out. If it weren't that simple, you'd have to take it into account. Anyway, there's an NU equals one from this contribution and an NS uh, equals one from this. But this diagram here doesn't appear over there. So this one should be uh, NT equals zero. So the reason the uh, BCJ relation works in this case, which was supposed to be something like NU is NS minus NT, and it works because one of them is zero and the other two are equal. So this is very special. I mean, the particular way it works is special to N equals four. If you were to do it in QCD, you would have triangles in there, but the triangles would still obey a kind of relation like this. It would just be a non-trivial three-term relation, whereas this one really degenerates to a two-term relation because one of them is zero. And you can uh, also write a very compact form for the two-loop amplitude in this theory. In this case, there are some uh, integrals, uh, two loops that are intrinsically non-planar. And um, it's a longer formula, but the rest of the terms are obtained by just permuting two, three, and four. Yeah. No, multiplication. Yeah, it's just multiplication. You just take the formula in terms of the Park-Taylor and uh, once you multiply it by S and T, it becomes a totally symmetric uh, function. So when you apply permutations, 
it doesn't matter whether you put it inside or outside because it's totally permutation invariant. And uh, anyway, you have similar things. The BCJ relations can be checked here as well. And they have similar things involving um, non-planar giving you a numerator factor of one, this one here, and then you draw a little four-point thing here, and you go look and what's the third one, and the third one requires you to uh, draw something like this, but you see that that isn't there, and so you again you get to use one equals one minus zero. And then you go to three loops, and now you start to find three-term relations, and, and then it gets much more intricate. But uh, so there are actually, uh, in this theory, there are BCJ satisfying representations. For L equals one, two, three, four. And then there's also lots of, uh, or L equals one reps for lots of theories. At least for low numbers of legs. Maybe not for generic. Uh, yeah. I'm saying that you can find, there's no sort of general proof that I know of that BCJ has to work above tree level. And so quite often when people, uh, well I, actually there's been some more recent work maybe trying to argue that it should hold, but I haven't followed it closely. In the past the uh, way you did it was you you uh, maybe used a bunch of Feynman diagrams and, and uh, worked out the numerator algebra and then you made some onsatz or guess for what form the numerator polynomials should have. And then you ch checked that you could obey all of the, or you put constraints on the onsatz in order by imposing the BCJ relations and looking for a solution. In this case, the solution was found before the BCJ relations were known. And you could go back and stare at it and check that it was satisfied. But in cases with less supersymmetry or more loops, you could assume the BCJ relations hold, but they're very hard to solve completely in the abstract because they involve permuting around these numerators a lot. So you need, in the past, people solved them by uh, plugging into an onsatz. And then if the solution fails, you're not sure if the BCJ relations fail or if your ansatz just was not general enough. So that's sort of where things have been. I think there have been some suggestions for how to uh, understand it more systematically and maybe prove things, but I'm not quite sure where the final status of it is. Any other questions? So one of the cool things about the BCJ relations is that once you find them, at least at tree level, there is an argument that you can calculate gravity amplitudes from the BCJ numerators very, very uh, efficiently. Um, so th that, that's a way of taking uh, Yang-Mills, basically squaring it to get gravity. And if you find such relations at the loop level, it also gives you loop amplitudes in gravity or supergravity or whatever. Now I should say that there were already tree level relations between gauge theory and gravity long before the BCJ relations and they came out of string theory and so those are the Kawhi, Llewellyn, and Tai relations.
So we're going to look for uh, gravity equals Yang mill squared as a slogan. <clears throat> and the first uh, implementation of that was by uh, using string theory by Kawhi, Llewellyn, Ty, 1986. And again, I'm not going to go through string theory for you, but basically um, I mentioned that gluons come from uh, open string amplitudes. Open strings have uh, ends, so their world sheets have boundaries, and the gluons couple to the boundaries of the world sheet. So these are gluons. And gravitons are uh, closed string states. And closed string world sheets have no boundaries. They look like, uh, so the way to describe a graviton scattering amplitude would be from closed strings merging and splitting and stuff. But then you take these uh, states to go off to infinity and they sort of shrink to zero size and become these X's here. So this is just a sketch of what a closed string amplitude looks like. So you have gravitons that are interacting through this closed string world sheet. And the vertices here sort of are a complex variable in the interior whereas these are more like real variables on the boundary. So if you have a, something, some integral to do in the complex plane, you can deform that integral and kind of move things along real and imaginary axes and convert a two-dimensional integral into a product of one-dimensional integrals. And I'm being very sketchy, sorry, but uh, it would take too long to go through all the details. So roughly speaking, this closed string integral looks like products of open string integrals. And then when you reduce down to the field theory limit, just like we were discussing for the BCJ relations, so you take the momenta to zero relative to the uh, characteristic string scale, which is often called one over the square root of alpha prime, then you get relations and I'm just going to write some of these down. So this is this relation. Well, we already saw the three-point relation, which was literally the square. But for the four-point relation, this is the four graviton amplitude. And you get S12, A4, tree, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then here you get A4 tree. Maybe I should put a tilde on it because it's now in, uh, it's permuted around. And these are both gluon amplitudes. So these gravitons have, can have different helicities. And just like in the gluon case, you're going to get zero unless two of them are minus and two of them are plus. So the instructions here are, take the graviton helicity here, say, suppose it's minus two. Then you use the minus for leg one. Then you use minus here and minus here. Or if it was a plus two helicity graviton, you use plus here and plus here. Okay, so that gives you the instructions for which helicities to use on the right-hand side. So if this is true, it also means that the uh, four graviton amplitudes of this type, where they're all plus or one minus, must also be zero because the factors on the right-hand side are zero, too. And that's, of course, in agreement with what you find. And then there's even more of these. I'll write maybe one more of them down.
And you can write these down for arbitrary numbers of legs. You just get more and more terms on the right-hand side. There's always two endpoint tree amplitudes. So it's like a double copy. You take two of these to get one of these. But at each order, you have more and more of these mantle stem variables and more and more permutations. Remember that these color ordered amplitudes only have poles in color adjacent channels. Gravity has no color. And therefore, if you find a pole in one channel of a given type, you must find it basically in all channels. So this, these amplitudes here have to have poles in all channels. And these have poles in just color adjacent channels. That's a very small subset of the total number of channels as you go to large numbers of legs. And so you need more and more permutations in order to have a chance of uh, getting all the proper poles for the graviton amplitudes. So these are, are really great, these KLT relations. They're just tree level relations though. You can use them at loop, ampli at loop level if you uh, break up a, uh, a loop amplitude into trees by chopping it in little bits. So we used unitarity, which is chopping loop amplitudes into little bits. And then we used these KLT relations to take the loop amplitude gravity uh, thing problem and turn it into the Yang-Mills case. So you could solve the Yang-Mills case and then you could feed it back in. But it was a little more, a little, a little complicated, much more straightforward if you uh, have the BCJ re relations. So let me just write down the BCJ proposal and uh, tell you that it's sort of been, it's been checked at the tree level. So, and then we'll quit for the day. And then when we come back next time, we'll uh, get as far as we can on, on actual loop meth, more general loop methods. So anyway, I'm just writing now the BCJ formula. So this is the cubic graphs. So you're saying find a, find a representation like this, although at tree level it's sort of guaranteed it must exist. So the only thing different between these two formulas is that the adjoint color factor in gauge theory has been removed and it's re been replaced by a second copy of the uh, uh, gravity uh, case. And if I were sort of at tree level, I could just write this as the square of NG. The only reason I write it as NG, NG tilde is that when you go to the loop level, you need to specify what kind of gauge theory and what kind of gravity theory you have. For example, you might have a certain amount of supersymmetry. And you don't need to have the same theory on both sides of the copy. And for example, you might have n equals 8 supergravity as n equals 4 SYM tensor n equals 4 SYM. But you might have a lower supergravity, uh, which is, for example, n equals 4 super Yang Mills tensor pure glue. You can do things like that. And in that case, these factors will be different, these n's and these n tildes. But anyway, this is, this is an amazing formula. It says if you can write the gauge theory in the right way, there's a simple prescription for generating gravity amplitudes. And there is a BCFW recursive proof of this. And uh, when I was very ambitious, I thought I might give it, but I'm not going to because it <laughs> takes a while. So we will uh, stop here and move on to loops next time. Thanks.
Any questions before the break?